Hello guys and welcome back to Rewind Reviews. Yes, you read the title correctly, we are going to be doing a spoiler talk video today for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Kind of goes without saying, this is a spoiler filled video, I am going to be going over a lot of spoilery details from the movie, so if you have not seen Across the Spider-Verse, I'd advise watching the movie before seeing this video. Now just before I begin, I do need to mention that this isn't going to be necessarily a breakdown of the entire story, I'm not going to go over all the little plot details from this movie, I'm just going to go over a few things that I did want to talk about that I could mention in a spoiler free review. The link to which is in the description. So starting off, one of the biggest surprises for me was the fact that this movie really does delve into Gwen's backstory. It was very largely hinted at in the first movie and we do see a few little glimpses of it few little flashbacks here and there during her montage sequence but we don't really understand everything that happened. So this movie does fill in those gaps and it does answer a few of those questions that people did have. And the biggest one being how is it that Peter Parker died in her universe and in her universe Peter Parker was the lizard. It is a really interesting twist on this story and I think that it is a really interesting concept and idea. Especially when Captain Stacy Gwen's father gets involved and he believes that Spider Gwen was the one who killed Peter and it really does drive a wedge between them especially with all the stuff that does happen throughout the movie it is a really good story and i do like how it is incorporated into this movie i honestly think that it is interesting enough that it could be just a movie all on its own but i like how it is used to further this story and where gwen is at this point in time i do like how it is tied into everything and as i said it is really hard to try balancing all these different stories but i think that how her origin how her backstory is tied into this movie how it all connects together within the overall story it does work very well and I think that it is very cleverly done. And I think it does a really good job of building up Gwen's character a lot more considering how she was in the first movie because we didn't really know too much about her outside of what we're told but this really does add a lot more to her character and I feel like because she is basically the co-main protagonist of this movie I think that it is a really good idea introducing that story into this movie. Now when it comes to the spot I wasn't really sure just how much I could really sort of talk about his character and how much he does factor into the overall story so I'm going to do that a little bit here I think that what they have done with him in this movie is genuinely incredible because of the direction that they have gone with him because how he is portrayed initially when you first meet him he is basically a joke villain of the week type character basically the sort of character that you expect him to be from the comics from the tv series any time that the spot has ever appeared that's more than likely how he is normally portrayed and that's where he starts off in this movie and then through the course of the movie what they do is sort of building his character up seeing his motivation why it is that he's doing what he's doing how he connects to miles what his goal is and what it is that he hopes to do with the way that he basically wants to become more powerful so that he can beat Spider-Man once and for all. That journey and seeing him becoming more and more powerful, more confident with his powers until eventually when he's gone to one of the other universes and he basically recreates this big fusion event that they did in the first movie so he becomes much more powerful it's really good and i love how it is built up over the course of the movie so you really do feel like he is becoming a much bigger threat and i really love how the art style and the music really do reflect that quite well because the music especially when it starts off when he's kind of like stuck in like this little void that's just surrounded by all these spots and it's just him on his own it's quite nice i'd say it's sort of like quite soothing in a way but then when he changes when he becomes more powerful not only does his color scheme completely change like he's no longer white with black dots everywhere he's basically like a black inky void with these little white spiral spots all over him it looks incredible but the music changes as well to something a lot more horrifying i really love that decision and the art style is really clever how it is that they've done what art style they have gone for him because when you see him initially he kind of looks like one of those pre-animated characters you know the ones where you just have like the outline and you see like all the little uh, circles and lines just sort of mark out the joint he's a little bit like that and then when he becomes more powerful he sort of looks more like a symbiote with the way that it's all sort of like writhing around you just see like all this ink all over him almost like an expression painting it just looks incredible even the way that his voice is as well i feel like that's a really big part in this because jason Schwartzman, as i said definitely does play up the more comedic elements and i thought that it was a really good choice for it initially anyway but hearing that more sinister side of him later on it really does work and i think that jason Schwartzman is absolutely fantastic i'll be honest my theory surrounding the spot actually didn't come to me until after i'd rewatched into the spider-verse about a week before i did my review for 
for that movie because during the final battle of that movie where uh, Miles and Kingpin are in the collider and there's like all these black spots and goo and all sorts floating around my mind immediately went to the spot and I kept thinking like that actually does not too far off like what it is that they are doing from him what I've seen in the trailers and clips so my theory did become is the spot connected to that event did he get caught up in that in some way and get like either brought through from another dimension or was he just caught in the room or the blast earlier on so i wasn't too far off when i said that he was actually involved in that incident because he was in the collider when this fight was taken off so it is a really clever twist on that and i said it does make you rethink what happened in the first movie a little bit more especially with how he ties into miles's origin story because this isn't just a case of the spot knows him or anything like that the spot is basically basically the one who actually creates him in the first place. Prior to him becoming the Spot, the Spot is basically just a scientist who works at Alchemex and he's experimenting with this multiversal machine that Kingpin is creating and one of the, the first things that he brings from another universe is the spider that bites Miles. So that answers one question that I do remember having when I saw the first movie when you see it glitching because I remember thinking like, oh that's quite similar to Peter and all the other spiders because it's not part of that dimension. But I never thought any more of of it so I am really happy seeing that that is actually paid off and they do answer that question in a really satisfying way. I also really like how they just go that one step further and they just sort of give you a little bit more of an idea about who the spot actually was before he actually became the spot. And I really love how it is that they tie it into that battle at Alchemex during the sequence with Doc Ock where Peter basically swipes one of the bagels and then Miles takes it off him and he throws it up on the scientists and as I said in the Into the Spider-Verse review you'd actually see somebody getting hit hit with it and there's a little thing over his head that says bagel that was him that is so subtle to add into this and i really love what it does mean to that character because it does make him come across as a bit more of a joke and somebody to not really take that seriously early on so you really do underestimate just how powerful and threatening he is going to be later on i really love how it is that they've done that and as i said this movie definitely left me with a bit of a craving for bagels but i like that it isn't just the one twist there is a lot more layers involved in this and i really love how every single one of them is revealed the biggest of which being because the spider is from a different universe earth 42 which is something that i did question a lot during the first movie why 42 two just seem to be absolutely everywhere and on a side note i never really understood what was with the bingo ball at the beginning of the first movie with the number 42 on it but apparently that is actually the number that enables the morales family to actually win the lottery to actually get the money needed in order to send miles off to visions academy but 42 is a number that does pop up a lot throughout the first movie and it does it again in this one and this does answer why because as i said the spider is from earth 42 the spider was meant to bite the miles from that universe so that universe is left without a spider-man miles morales the one that we are introduced in the first movie and the protagonist of this movie was never meant to be spider Man. I really love how this twist is revealed and how it does factor into the overall story because it does make you want to re-watch the first movie because you are seeing it completely differently. If Miles hadn't have been bitten he wouldn't have developed his powers and he wouldn't have gone back to Alchemax to go and find that spider ultimately leading to Peter Parker being killed off in that universe and Miles taken over as Spider-Man. Miles is an anomaly and I really love how that is explained and how much detail they're able to give to it. This is a multi multiverse movie so they do have to go into the concept of the multiverse and how the spider-verse works out and i really love how it is handled in this movie i feel like this is definitely one of the best interpretations of it and i feel like the multiverse itself is actually explained a lot better in this one because one thing that they introduce in this movie that's actually quite important to the overall story of spider-man just in general is this thing called canon events canon events in this movie are described as fixed points in time that ultimately go into shaping who these characters are they are events that need to happen in order for these characters to be who they are meant to be and i like how it is explained how it is shown because we do see a lot of other spider people through this and we do see how it is that the multiverse does work and how time ultimately works and i like how they do go about showing this and they do show just how important it is for these events to happen to different spider people obviously when it comes to peter parker the biggest canon event for him is 
Uncle Ben's death because that ultimately goes into shaping him becoming Spider-Man. We get this cool little montage where they kind of go over the different spiders from all these different universes and you see their different canon events. I really do like the ones that they do pick because there was a lot of speculation that we were going to potentially see appearances from Tom Holland, from Andrew Garfield, from Tobey Maguire. And we kind of do, but we kind of don't. It's just recycled footage from previous movies, but I do like how it is used, how they are integrated into the movie and it never feels out of place either. Either. I think that definitely is helped because all the different characters do have a very different art style and animation style to them so it does make sense having something that does look very different and they aren't an animated version of those interpretations of the characters they are the live action ones. Weirdly it is a bit strange why it is that Tom Holland doesn't actually show up in this at all why, why we don't see his variant of Spider-Man at all we only see Andrew and Toby. I suppose it sort of makes sense because I think Disney and Marvel would sort of be involved in that in some way and I think that would just get a bit too complicated but we do get a couple references to the MCU and I actually do quite like how those are used and the biggest of which being the multiversal timeline which was shown in Doctor Strange in Loki in Ant-Man and the Wasp I like how that is used in this movie how they do feature it as a proper easter egg to sort of show the multiverse and sort of connect it into the MCU in some way but I like how they do kind of separate it enough that they say that this is the multiversal timeline and then they show the web connecting all the different spiders together really love that angle. I was fully expecting Madam Web to maybe be in charge of the Spider Society but unfortunately that isn't the case so maybe we'll see her in the next one. But the other MCU reference in this movie is the thing that got the biggest reaction from my cinema screening and that is the live action appearance of Donald Glover as the Prowler. I'll be honest, that was the last thing I was expecting to see in this movie. And it was such a shock seeing him on screen in the full Prowler gear as well, but it's so cool actually seeing it. The MCU Spider-Man, look, I, I do really love those movies, but at the same time, I am disappointed with a lot of things that they have set up, especially in Homecoming, that they just haven't even gone near. Because at this point in time, the two biggest villains that they have set up in those movies are the Prowler and the Scorpion, and neither of those characters have shown up. So it is cool getting to see some sort of payoff off to at least one of them. I really love the costume that they've gone for with him as well. You don't really see it much of it because he is like through like this uh this hologram prison that he's, he's being kept in so you don't really get a, a proper look at the costume but it does look good from what we see. I don't know if this is really hinting at anything in the future I think it's just like a fun little thing just for fans. I know there are a lot of people wondering if we are going to now see the Prowler in Spider-Man 4 which is in development right now but I'm not sure if that's going to be the case. I know there are plans for a live action Miles Morales appearance within the MCU but I don't know how that is really going to work and personally I think that what they've done with him in these animated movies Miles Morales how they've handled him in these movies I just don't know how the MCU is going to really come near. There are definitely ways around it, but I feel like they do risk just repeating the exact same story once again, which is the thing that they wanted to avoid with Tom Holland's Peter Parker. So as excited as I am to see Miles Morales in live action finally, I am definitely a bit cautious on how it is that they are going to approach it and just see how different it will be. So I am interested in seeing what it is that they do with him ultimately. On a side note, there is actually a really big connection between Donald Glover and Miles Morales. Because before Miles Morales was actually created, Brian Michael Bendis, who is the writer who created Miles Morales, saw an episode of Community, which is a sitcom from America. It's a really funny show. If you've never seen it before, I highly recommend checking it out. But one of the episodes actually features Donald Glover getting out of his bed and he's wearing a Spider-Man t-shirt and apparently that image was the inspiration for Miles Morales. So of course when Miles Morales did get brought into the Ultimate Spider-Man TV series, I don't know if he voices him in Marvel's Spider-Man or not, but he did get asked to voice Miles Morales and he did voice him in that show. And then he actually got to appear in live action as Aaron Davis in Spider-Man Homecoming. So I really do love seeing Donald Glover actually making an appearance in this considering just how much of a connection he does have to Miles Morales. And I've got to be honest, I am genuinely amazed that they managed to keep that cameo a secret for as long as they did. Because if any of you guys ever Ever see any marketing from Sony Pictures one of the things that they are very bad at is keeping secrets they have definitely gotten better at it over the years but I do think that they still do have a lot of room for improvement because one of the big things that they did spoil in this one was one of the live action cameos I think it was a PlayStation advert I'm not sure but one of the things that they actually showed in that advert was Mrs Chen who is a character from the Venom movies and I'll be honest that didn't really get much of a reaction from my audience probably doesn't help that this is a PG movie and the Venom movies are 
they're all 15s or PG-13, so the younger age group probably won't be familiar with that character. It is cool seeing how it is that all these movies are tied together. I mean, especially when it came to the first Venom movie, because the post credit scene for that movie was a scene from Into the Spider-Verse. So I like how they have kind of connected all these films together. I personally don't really like the Venom movies, but they do have their fans, so I'm sure that some people will be really happy with that. On a side note, I don't normally like talking about the box office for a lot of these movies, but when it comes to this movie, this movie especially has done a lot better than the first one has. In fact, at this point in time, it has matched and gone beyond what the first movie did, which is really great to see considering just how well received the first movie did. And the first movie did deserve to have a much bigger box office than it actually did. Because one thing that actually really annoyed me was seeing just how much Venom made, considering just how divisive that movie was. And I think it was something like 800 million in the box office in total, which is almost three times more than Spider-Verse. And to this day, I still don't know how, but I'm really glad that this one is doing much better than the first movie and it absolutely deserves. It. Anyway, those cameos are utilised really well and I feel like what it is that they have done with a lot of the other cameos is really good and there's loads of them. I wasn't really sure about who it was that I could talk about in the spoiler free review considering now some of them weren't really featured in a lot of the marketing. I think the biggest of which is Ben Riley, aka the Scarlet Spider voiced by Andy Samberg. He did appear in some of the trailers and he did get his own poster as well. I think he is a really fun character. I do think he does have some of the funnier lines and how it is that they have portrayed him because he is a character from the 90s era of comics and the 90s era was very dark and edgy and the art style honestly the art style that they've gone for with him is really good and it is directly out of those comics but they really do play into that sort of edgier sort of side to it the way that he's just dark and brooding and nobody understands the torture that he's been through but it's just the way that they portray it it's really funny and it is really clever and i like how they sort of weave in some of his dialogue as well because he can't help but narrate everything that he does just to the fact that when he's like perched on one of the walls he just like talks about how he's posing for it i thought it was really funny i thought it was quite clever how he was integrated into this but we've seen some of the other spider people as well like jessica drew does have a small presence in this movie i thought they were going to do a little bit more with her than they actually did to be honest so i was a little disappointed by that but i think that she was fine overall i did think it was quite funny seeing how spider-man unlimited was integrated in this movie considering that I didn't actually know this at the time, but apparently the Spider-Man Unlimited TV series was originally envisioned as a 2099 show and it was going to be all about Miguel O'Hara. Probably explains why it is that the costumes are so similar, but it was pretty cool seeing him being introduced in this movie considering that not a lot of people really like that show. I didn't mind it overall. It could have been a lot better to be honest. But it is really fun getting to see a lot of these other Spider people getting some attention, especially Spectacular Spider-Man. Spectacular Spider-Man is the best animated Spider-Man TV series that we have ever gotten. It was very, very tragically cancelled after two seasons and it got replaced with Ultimate Spider-Man, which I've never really got into, to be honest. So it was great getting to see Spectacular Spider-Man there on screen, voiced by Josh Keaton. So it was just amazing getting to see that. I know they did spoil his cameo in this. Again, this is Sony on the posters. So I was expecting him to show up, but it was really great getting to see him. I did wonder if we were going to see Insomniac Spider-Man, the one from the PlayStation video games. And we do. There is a little small brief glimpse of him. I like how that they've actually chosen the one from the upcoming game. I also like when Miles goes back to his dorm in Visions Academy that Ganky is there playing the Spider-Man video game. I really do love a lot of the little cameos that they do include in this one. There's a lot of characters that I'm not really familiar with, like the cat I've never seen before, the dinosaur, just oh my god. There's even a spider buggy in this as well. I think my favourite one is probably the cowboy Spider-Man, just the way that they actually use him and even his horse has got a little spider bandana on it. But one of the scenes that really made me laugh the most is when Miles actually does confront him and they're on the horse and they do like the uh, Mexican standoff it's just a close-up of the eyes and he's like okay on the count of three one two and then miles just webs him he didn't wait till three i really do love how they do sort of play into what it is that you do expect from these characters they really do play up a lot of the comedy of these different variants but it does work and it really does fit within the tone even the spider popsicle that was shown on screen in the first movie actually makes a little appearance in this i didn't even spot him in the movie but he is there <laughs> although i do find it a bit strange that spider ham is actually absent from this movie like all the others do 
make a reappearance somewhere in this movie, but he's the only one who doesn't. But one scene that really did surprise me, but it shouldn't really have been that much of a surprise considering who it is that's actually working on this movie. Lord and Miller worked on the Lego movie. So there is actually a little section in this movie that does play, take place in a Lego universe. And it is quite a funny little sequence and I do like what it is that they do and they do sort of keep the same sort of tone and sound effects that they had from the Lego movie. It, it does feel like it is part of those movies. But the most surprising thing about it is that it is actually stop motion and it was created by a 14 year old who does have a YouTube channel. They are really good. I have seen some of their work before and it is incredible. And apparently the reason why he actually got to work on this movie in the first place was because he actually recreated the Across the Spider-Verse trailer in stop motion Lego. And it is genuinely amazing. If you've not seen any of his videos, go check him out. I'll put a link to his channel down in the description. But as I said, how all these cameos are fitted into the movie does make sense. It never feels out of place. They don't feel like they are just added into this just for the sake of just fan service. Yes, there is absolutely a lot of fan service in this movie, but that isn't necessarily a bad thing, especially if it is utilised properly. And most of this is kept to those sequences within the Spider Society, so it never feels out of place whenever any of these other characters do appear. And I am genuinely shocked how long it actually took that entire sequence to make. Like the big chase sequence where Miles is getting pursued by all these different Spider-Man variants took, according to one of the producers, four years to make. I absolutely believe that but I think that it is absolutely paid off because it is an absolutely spectacular sequence. But one of the reasons why I feel like it does work as well as it does is because it is still focused on Miles's story. Because as I said when it comes to the spot he is gradually becoming more and more powerful and during the sequence when he does gain all the power that he needs in order to beat Spider-Man, Miles actually gets a little bit of a glimpse about what is going to happen in the future and it's this really really trippy sequence that almost kind of plays across almost like a storyboard which is actually quite a clever idea to be honest and it shows what it is that the spot is planning to do the spot is basically planning to travel to Miles's universe and he is going to cause so much destruction that Jeff Miles's father is going to perish in the chaos and the reason why Miles is in conflict with the Spider Society with Miguel O'Hara is because Miles wants to go and save his dad he wants to prevent this canon event from happening Jeff is going to die and if Miles prevents that then his universe could come to an end I think it is a fantastic dilemma to put Miles in because this is something that is very familiar to any Spider-Man fan. We know that these big events do happen and they do have a big part in shaping who these characters are. But I like how it is taking that idea and it is changing it into something that we haven't really seen before. It's actually making these characters aware that this is going to happen and what it is that they are now trying to do is will they be able to either prevent it or let it happen? And that's the big dilemma that Miles has to go through in this movie and it does put the audience in a bit of a situation as well because on the one hand, yeah, Miles should get the chance to save his dad because it's his dad. And all the stuff with his family is a really big important part of who his character is and it's a really big important part of these movies. I think that what they've done with Miles and his family is fantastic. I love the relationship that they have. But at the same time, you do see what it is that can happen if these canon events are changed or altered in some way. And I like that they chose Miguel to be the character to actually showcase this because you see his backstory and you see that he did change things from what they were originally meant to be and that universe that he decided to go into was ultimately wiped out because he changed things. So it is a really big dilemma and I do think that it is a really great question to ask the audience and to put the characters through as well. Can you alter destiny and how much of a repercussion on that universe will that have? And then the real question is whose side are you on? Miles or Miguel? And that's how Gwen fits into this story because she is somebody who has gone through these characters and events and it has ultimately shaped who she is with Peter dying in her universe but her journey throughout the movie sees her actually deciding not to actually side with Miguel and actually wanting to help Miles in saving his dad and by the end of the movie she is basically forming her own band as it were to basically try and go up against the spider society so I think that we are going to see in Beyond the Spider-Verse a spider war and I think that it is a really great place to actually leave this movie off as well because it does kind of round out the character arcs that both Miles and Gwen have in this movie but it leaves it open enough for where part two is going to pick up because when it comes to Miles 
the way that that big chase sequence ends is he sneaks into this lab where they were able to basically send uh, characters to their home dimensions and what he does is he imprints his own DNA into this machine that sends him back to his universe or so he thinks and it is really really cleverly played out because it does make you kind of guess whether it is he actually has gone home or not because the art style and the colour that they've gone for is very different from his universe but considering how most of the movie has kind of showed the emotion can sort of play around with the art style and the sort of general colouring that they have gone for and it does trick you into thinking that maybe he is back in his own universe but I like how that is built up over that sequence with the ultimate revelation that he is not on his own universe he is on Earth 42, the place where the spider originated from. He is now stuck in the universe where Spider-Man never existed. And I love how that is played out. And I love the little twist that they have added into this. Because not only in this universe has Jeff died, but his uncle Aaron Davis is still alive. And in this universe, Miles Morales became the Prowler. And I love that this is where the cliffhanger actually comes in because this is the Miles Morales who was meant to be bitten by the spider that our Miles Morales was. And I love how that's even sort of reflected in the colour scheme as well because the way that Miles G Morales, as he's called in this universe, is also coloured in red and blue, all the lighting around him is all red and blue, but then Miles Morales that we know is sort of in red and blue just around his sides but it's mostly purple because he was never meant to be Spider-Man. It has left it quite open-ended for where this story could ultimately go like it genuinely could go absolutely anywhere and beyond the Spider-Verse but I really do love that this is the place that they decided to have the cliffhanger. It does fit the arc that these characters are going on but it still does leave it open enough for where they are ultimately going to go in the next movie. I will admit I do agree with some people where it did kind of feel like the ending was kind of just sort of dragging on just a little bit longer than it really needed to but I feel like where they have ended it I feel like it is just the right place and I will admit when it was actually sort of gearing up towards the ending I did kind of feel myself sort of going I feel like the movie's going to end any time now and it was like some of the scenes I was thinking like I think it's gonna end here no it's still going it's still going no I think it's gonna end here no it's still going it's still going so I wasn't really too surprised when it actually did end because it did sort of feel like it was kind of gearing up to the big cliffhanger end but I really did love this movie overall and yes this is only part one of two but I really do love what it is that they have done with this movie and where it was that they decided to end this one as I said I've definitely got a few theories around him where it is that the next movie could go I've got a lot of questions surrounding what can happen the first question being will Miles be able to save his dad I don't know I really do feel like it could could go either way. The other question being how will they stop the spot? They are ultimately going to be able to stop him but I really don't know how considering just how powerful he is and considering just what his abilities are. I do wonder with the introduction of this new Prowler plus this new Aaron Davis whether they will either help or be a hindrance to Miles. With all the different spider people who made an appearance in this movie there's some that didn't make an appearance. Will they make an appearance in the next one? Will we see others that we've never seen in these movies before? Will Madam Web factor into it in some way? Have her like narrative rating it all as it's all playing out a bit like the watcher i really do feel like the next movie could go absolutely anywhere and that's one of the reasons why i'm so excited about it because i genuinely don't know and i'm really looking forward to finding out and i'm just hoping that sony don't spoil it all in the marketing i know that beyond the spider-verse is going to be the last movie within the spider-verse trilogy which is really sad because this has definitely been the best spider-man trilogy ever so far Hopefully Beyond the Spider-Verse actually sticks to landing. But if it does, this will be the best superhero movie trilogy ever made. But I don't think this is going to be the end of the Spider-Verse continuity altogether. I do know there are going to be a few different spin-offs that are in development right now. I know Spider-Man Noir is supposed to be getting a TV series. I don't know what direction they're going to take with that, whether they'll go more the comic book route, whether it's a bit more serious and a bit more dark and violent, or if they're going to go with the more comedic route as he was in Into the Spider-Verse. The Spider-Man Noir comic, are a lot darker and a lot more violent than other versions of Spider-Man so I would like to see them explore that but I did love that interpretation in Into the Spider-Verse so I wouldn't mind seeing more of that version if that is the direction that they are going to go. I know there has been talk of a Spider-Gwen spin-off whether that's a movie or TV series I'm not quite sure but I really have grown to love this version of the character and I really am interested in seeing where they go with her in the future. I'm kind of hoping we get to see a 2099 spin-off in the future as well. I feel like he is a really interesting character. I feel like the visual 
tools that they could come out with could be really interesting. I feel like that would be something that we've never really seen before. I know we're probably never going to get a Batman Beyond movie anytime soon, so I feel like a 2099 movie would actually be a pretty good substitute. And then when it comes to Tom Holland's Spider-Man 4, as I said a little bit earlier on, yes, there is definitely possibility of the Prowler being a presence in that movie with Donald Glover playing the Prowler in that movie, but I don't know. I have heard rumours around what the fourth movie is going to be about, and I've heard Mr. Negative is supposed to be the main villain of that movie, so I don't know how the Prowler would really sort of fit into that. Plus, due to the writer's strike, it has been delayed, so they could change their mind in the future, so we'll just have to wait and see with that one. But one thing that surprised me is that they have unveiled that there is actually a short animated Spider-Verse movie that has been released at a film festival somewhere, I'm not sure which one it is, but it all focuses on Miles and the struggle with him being Spider-Man. And it's supposed to be like a horror short, and that's how it's being described by some of the people who have seen it. It's called The Spider Within, and they've only released one single image of it at this point in time, so I am really curious to see where it is that they actually release it, whether it's going to be a Blu-ray exclusive or if it's going to be something that they release online. I'm really interested to see it because it does sound really interesting. So I'll definitely be keeping an eye out for that when it gets released. But where the future of this franchise goes, it genuinely is anybody's guess. I know Sony are charging on ahead with all their villain spin-offs, none of which really sound very appealing to me, to be honest. I know Craven is supposed to be out this year, 2023. I don't really know how I feel about that one. I'm really not sure on the direction that they are going to go with Craven, especially since the main motivation behind him, Spider-Man, is not even going to be part of it. And we've also got the Mazam Web movie, which I, I don't really know how to feel about that either because I just don't really understand the concept behind it. It's just not the idea of Madam Web that I would have gone with. Personally, if I was doing a Madam Web project, I would have done a TV series and have it basically play out like a What If style series where Madam Web, the older Madam Web with the uh, chair with all the spider web behind her she would basically be dropping in and out and all these different spider people across the universes and each episode would be a different spider-man but i'm definitely curious in seeing what it is that that movie is going to be considering just how secretive they've been around it so i would kind of like to see what it is that they actually have in store for it and then of course we've got venom 3 on the horizon as well i genuinely don't know how. There are a lot of people who are convinced that Spider-Man is going to play a big part in that movie. I don't personally see it to be honest because as far as I'm aware Spider-Man doesn't exist within the Sony Venom verse as it were and if he does I don't think it is going to be any pre-established Spider-Man. I don't think we're going to see Tom Holland. I don't think we're going to see Andrew Garfield or Tobey Maguire. To be honest it would be more likely to be Andrew Garfield than anything else but I don't really think that that will be the case. And I have been very vocal about this in the past that I don't really know what the motivation would be for Venom going up against Spider-Man because Eddie Brock doesn't know Peter Parker, there's no Peter Parker as far as we're aware in the Venomverse, so what would the motivation be behind him wanting to go after him? I know there is like a hive mind that connects all the different symbiotes across the multiverse, but I just don't feel like that's a good enough motivation for Venom to go up against Spider-Man, because the whole point is that Spider-Man, in Venom's eyes, ruins Eddie Brock's life, so that is the motivation that Eddie Brock needs to go up against him. None of that's happened in the MCU or the Venomverse, so I just don't see where that motivation would really come from, and I just don't feel like it would really be a satisfying payoff. So we'll see what that movie does. Well, I think that is pretty much everything I really want to say for this video. I think I've gone over all the points that I really wanted to mention. Apart from one other thing, and that has nothing to do with Spider-Man whatsoever, it has all to do with this channel. We have very recently crossed 200 subscribers and 40,000 views, which is really scary, but I am genuinely really thankful for everyone who has supported this channel since it began all the way through till now every single person who has tuned into one of these videos who has liked who has been subscribing everyone who has watched these videos thank you so much for all the support it genuinely means a lot i know i mention it every time we cross a milestone but i really do appreciate it every single time thank you so much for all the support thank you well i think that is a good place to wrap this video up so if you have watched this video thank you very much for watching as always if you haven't please like please subscribe and hit the notification button to keep up to date on everything that is going on on here if you have seen across the spider-verse let me know down in the comments what you think about it there are no spoiler restrictions whatsoever for this video, so if you do have any thoughts whatsoever about Cross the Spider-Verse, Into the Spider-Verse or Beyond the Spider-Verse, 
let me know down below. Also, if you have any suggestions for any future rewind reviews you would like to see me do, let me know. If you haven't seen me spoil the free video for Across the Spider-Verse or my review for Into the Spider-Verse, both those videos are available on my channel. I will have the link to them down in the description on this video. Thank you once again for watching and I'll see you next time on Rewind Reviews. See you guys.